The Boston Caucus was an informal political organization that had considerable influence in Boston in the years before and after the American Revolution. This was perhaps the first use of the word caucus to mean a meeting of members of a movement or political party to agree on a common position. The Boston Caucus was established in around 1719 by the popular physician and merchant Alicia Cook, Jr. It quickly grew as a powerful political force in the area but its later activities are what associate it most with Samuel Adams and the run-up to American independence. Adams became an influential leader of the caucus in the 1750s and used the club in the 1760s and 1770s to help gain him political leeway. The group developed a nefarious, rebellious reputation, meeting in taverns, and plotting. The Boston caucus and Samuel Adams were reputed to have had significant influence in 1773 with the events associated with the Boston Tea Party. Early years no written records survive of the early years of the caucus before 1840, but there is strong evidence to suggest that it was established around 1719 by the popular physician and merchant Alicia Cook, Jr. Cook was one of the richest men in the province, with an estate valued at his death in 1737 at £63,000. He was a heavy drinker, and the owner of the Goat Tavern on King Street. Another early member of the caucus was Deacon Adams, father of Samuel Adams, a wealthy businessman who became an eminent figure in New England politics. The goals of the caucus were to protect the interests of the lower and middle classes in Boston, and to champion popular programs. Members of the caucus included the leadership of the Popular Party, also known as the Whig or patriots, and the caucus had growing influence in Boston as it defined issues, promoted political views and challenged the authority of the crown, although providing representation for the common people. The caucus in some ways subverted the democratic process by setting the agenda for the Boston town meetings in advance, and through concerted action largely predetermining the results. According to Peter Oliver, the last chief Justice of Massachusetts before the Revolution. The caucus spent huge amounts of money on liquor to win elections in the 1720s. Cook seems to also have had much influence in the marked relaxation in liquor licensing in the 1720s, which was popular with large numbers of voters. The historian G. B. Warden said that Alicia Cook, Jr., contributed more than anyone else to the public life of colonial Boston. Early years. No written records survive of the early years of the caucus before 1840, but there is strong evidence to suggest that it was established around 1719 by the popular physician and merchant Alicia Cook, Jr. Cook was one of the richest men in the province, with an estate valued at his death in 1737 at £63,000. He was a heavy drinker, and the owner of the Goat Tavern on King Street. Another early member of the caucus was Deacon Adams, father of Samuel Adams, a wealthy businessman who became an eminent figure in New England politics. The goals of the caucus were to protect the interests of the lower and middle classes in Boston, and to champion popular programs. Members of the caucus included the leadership of the Popular Party, also known as the Whig or patriots, and the caucus had growing influence in Boston as it defined issues, promoted political views and challenged the authority of the crown, although providing representation for the common people. The caucus in some ways subverted the democratic process by setting the agenda for the Boston town meetings in advance, and through concerted action largely predetermining the results. According to Peter Oliver, the last chief Chief Justice of Massachusetts before the Revolution. The caucus spent huge amounts of money on liquor to win elections in the 1720s. Cook seems to also have had much influence in the marked relaxation in liquor licensing in the 1720s, which was popular with large numbers of voters.
The historian G. B. Warden said that Alicia Cook, Jr., contributed more than anyone else to the public life of colonial Boston. Samuel Adams era. Samuel Adams, whose father had been one of the founders of the caucus, became an influential leader of the caucus in the 1750s. Adams also became part of the Sons of Liberty, a mass movement of mostly working-class men that could be used in street protests to support the goals of the Boston leaders. Opposed to British rule, the caucus remained true to its principles of supporting the rights of the common man to political and economic freedom. However, in 1763 members of the court party gave a less flattering view of what they called the junto, saying that the members of the caucus were involved only to gain personal advantage, and that they opposed the government for this reason. Some said that Samuel Adams used the caucus to make himself dictator of Boston. This slur originated with loyalists who hated Adams and could not believe that common people, the mob, could act in their own interests without guidance from Adams. From 1751 the caucus collaborated with a merchant's club, a select group of ship owners and wholesalers, to protest the oppressive tactics of royal customs officials. Three more caucus clubs were formed in the 1760s, for the South End, North End and Middle. In addition to the original club, Sam Adams was a member of all of them. These clubs complemented the Loyal Nine and Sons of Liberty Patriot organizations, but various other clubs also had political goals, notably the Freemasons Lodge of St. Andrews. The North End Caucus seems to have been launched in 1767, although the first records are from 1772. This caucus first met in the Salutation Tavern and later in the Green Dragon Tavern. Paul Revere was a member. It is at the Green Dragon Tavern that Adams and the caucus were said to have conspired to hatch the Boston Tea Party plot of 1773. Critical Commentary on the Press A critical commentary on the press's treatment of Andrew Jackson, and on the practice of nominating candidates by caucus during the presidential race of 1824 with James Atkins' cartoon pointedly attacks Republican. Nominee William Crawford and his powerful supporter Martin Van Buren, Jackson, in military uniform, stands amid a pack of snarling dogs labeled with the names of various critical newspapers. He rests his right hand upon a sword inscribed, Veni Vidi Vici. One dog, named Richmond Wig, is whipped by a nude black boy who says, Mars Andra Ieri say de C.A.H. Judog belongs to Tunis, bark loud. Somebody teef way paper and amp, sherm one ghost, white like clay, dat mac um feared. Name oh, God, nobody gwine feared now for Crawford ghost, look pon da sleepy dog, jumbi da ride um, can't bark no mo for Crawford, quote. In the lower left corner a dog named Democratic Press is ridden by a skeletal death figure holding a loft a tract with the words Immortal Memory, R.E.V.D. James Quigley basely sacrificed conscience of vaunt. On the dog's side appear the words Good Sprite, In Mercy Lash Me With A Dry Corn Stalk, I'm so jaded by stable swooning smoke how steams and amp, hog cellar sweats. A five-headed dog named Hartford Convention also appears at lower left. In the left background, before a building marked Uncle Sam's Treasury Pap House, Amalgamation Tool Department, Treasury Secretary William Crawford offers a bowl of dollars to a befeathered woman, saying, Here's a bowl full of solid papo's meat. That's a good girl. Better marry our wild Indians than foreigners, good or bad. She says, Oh, stuff your mouth, you brat. Treasury Pap is better than rum. An Indian beside her says, Rum for the baby. Below the image is a text from Shakespeare's Coriolanus. What would you have, you curs, that like not peace, nor war? Who deserves greatness, deserves your hate, and your affections are a sick man's appetite. With every minute you'd change a mind, and call him noble that was now your hate. Him vile that was your garland.